Pre Preservation Subcommittee 2023 for the second webinar. And we are privileged to have Dr. Mittal for his one topic, one speaker talk on STO, its utility and relevance in clinical scenario. Dr. Astogi, you are not audible anymore, sir. Uh, sir. Sir, go down on the arrow, on the left corner, left corner, if you want to go. Yes, sir. Yeah. Or just press the, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. But I'm not Arrow sure. here. Arrow on yes, the left corner. Now you are corner. audible, sir. Yes. For forward the, this one, sir. Yes, sir. And for this, um, we are happy to have our president elect Dr. Ram Chadha and vice president Dr. Anu Pagrawal. Last time, as we discussed, he, we have a huge problem at our hand with more than 46 million people who suffer from knee pain and they have need to sit on the floor as cross-legged in a squat for activity of daily living and social cultural needs. We are not very affluent country. We are 45th in the 94th position in healthcare index. And as we discussed, there are three domains of learning and they are knowledge and attitude. And by organizing these webinars around the year, we have committed ourselves to provide all the orthopedic surgeons across the country with knowledge, which will help them change their attitude for knee conservation. And then in the last face-to-face -face meeting as pre-conference workshop, on 13th December at Lucknow, we'll have a workshop which will be live. for planning live and for saw bone exercise. So objective of the treatment for a knee osteoarthritis is to conserve the knee for life. And for this, the role of lifestyle modification, weight control and exercise was amply stressed about by our last past president, Dr. Sain. And then we discussed about the su success story of STO. And we must remember all the time that TKR is the internal amputation of knee. And this treatment is only good for the last 10 years of one's life. And the, today's uh, objective of the webinar is STO, its utility and relevance in current scenario so that we can answer all questions, how useful it is, where to do it, how to plan for it and proceed with it. And for this, we have Dr. Ravi Mittal, whose main area of interest is knee preservation. And he comes from the premier institute of the country or India Institute of Medical Sciences. Then we'll have a panel discussion and question answer session in which we have Dr. Milin Chaudhary, who is director of the Lizaro Technique at Kola. He has keen interest in conservation and he has mastered the art of PCVO. Then we have uh, Dinesh Thakkar from Ahmedabad. He is also joint secretary of IOA and he will also be panelist. And we have Dr. Ajit Sehgal, who is also member of IOA Knee Preservation Committee, and incidentally, he is also Secretary General of SARC Orthopedic Association. And this is me. And now we have a word of wisdom from our President-elect, Dr. Ram Chadha.
Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Indian Orthopedic Association and on behalf of my dear colleague, Dr. Atul Srivastava, President IOA, I welcome you all for this, the second of the webinars of the sub-speciality of knee as far as preservation is concerned. I have with me uh, Dr. Anu Pagrawal, our Honorable Vice President, and Dr. Dinesh Thakkar, our Joint Secretary representing the IOA. I welcome each one of you, specifically Dr. Ravi Mittal, who has given us the time and is going to share his knowledge with us. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Rastogi, Dr. Milin Chaudhary, my dear friend from Akola, uh, Dr. Dinesh Thakkar, I have already welcomed. And if Mangal joins us, it will be a pleasure to have Mangal as well. Sehgal Saab, I believe, will be joining us shortly. I go back to the training days when I worked at Cyan Hospital and Milin worked in a close-by hospital where Dr. Katie Dolakia used to do a left-handed transverse incision below the knee. And he used to do a close wedge osteotomy. And it used to be a matter of minutes. He used to go out, have a cup of coffee, come back and plaster the knee himself. And for us, that was high tibial osteotomy done by the best in the best circumstances. I moved to Chennai in 1994, end of 1994. And lo behold, I was exposed to a medial open wedge. I said, this is interesting. Iliac crest used to be open. Three large wedges of bone used to be taken out. And the laminar spreader, which we used in the spine, was taken away from us that day and opened up on the medial side. And these three large wedges of iliac crest were put in there. Well, all these patients seemed to do well. Till finally, the trade got in. And then everybody got into putting more and more resurfacing. I was taught that use the word resurfacing, don't call it total knee replacement. And then it has evolved to a stage now where we have a balanced opinion. We have people, even the leading surgeons themselves, who've gone for neither the knee replacement nor the close or open wedge, but have got rings to get themselves corrected gradually. So somewhere in between is the correct answer. To help us today, we have this very elite, eloquent, enabled group of knowledgeable teachers who's going to share their opinion with us. And I'm sure it will be something where each one of us would learn to move forward and put in the TKR as the last and not the first resort. Thank you for having this meeting. Thank you for inviting us. And back to you, Dr. Astog. Thank you, Dr. Chadha. Now, I request Dr. Anup to quickly say a word of blessings as the uh, vice president. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjay Rastogi, sir, for having me here. It's a pleasure to meet you all. And uh, I can say that uh, Dr. Sanjay Rastogi is one of the pioneers who is holding high about the HTO. And we have Dr. Melin Chaudhary, Dr. Ravi, uh, Dr. Ram Chadda, sir, has already told you about that where we are lying. And this art we all must learn. And today's the time where Dr. Ravi Mittal is going to put a light on this particular aspect. So I'll not come in between the academics and uh, the delegates. Back to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Anu. Now I request Dr. Ravi Mittal to take us the present status of HTO. Can I share the slide? Yes, sir. Uh, can you see my full screen? No. Hi. Now it is clear. Yeah. And your voice is clear. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, I'll to uh, thank uh, all the officials from the Indian Orthopedic Association and Dr. Sanjay Rastogi for giving me this opportunity. I also thank my co-panelists uh, who will be helping me in this presentation. And I thank all the audience and the doctors who have joined us for this webinar. I'll begin on a, a philosophical note. A journal, uh, in the Journal of Arthroscopy, in the issue of August 2022, an editorial was published, which was entitled Stop Overtreatment, Overdiagnosis, 
and medicalization of normal to improve healthcare outcomes. And the editor talked about a book called Hypocrisy. And the hypocrisy word is derived from the word Hippocrates, who is the father of the modern medicine, and the word hypocrisy. And in this editorial, uh, the editor suggested that doctors who base their practices on what is commonly accepted, on what they perceive to be effective, are often unknowingly wrong. That means what they believe at times is wrong and they base all their practices on that. And the word was unknowingly wrong. They are not deliberately wrong, but unknowingly wrong. So why they are wrong? Because they are all bombarded with some false evidence. This false evidence comes in uh, uh, form of print media, electronic media, uh, WhatsApp, and also emails. And this false evidence is bombarded so much from all the sides that it starts appearing real. And at times, this false evidence is also propagated from our senior colleagues uh, in various conferences or seminars or webinars. But the problem is that it is also is it is false, and one has to be beware of these false evidence. To give you an example, now I'm getting all these advertisements on my WhatsApp, on my emails by a company, and in the garb of patient information, patient awareness, knee replacement is being advertised for the treatment of large joint, dis joint disease. Now, the only treatment that they are advocating is joint replacement, nothing else. So one has to be aware of these kind of advertisements and knowledge that is being propagated by various uh, sources. Now, knee replacement is very popular. It is widely and aggressively marketed by the companies. Patients come and demand this procedure and surgeons go out and sell this procedure. So when I talk about uh, HTO, it is like swimming against the tide. But I'll try my best to convince the audience about the utility of HTO in the current scenario. Now, when we look at the osteoarthritis of the knee, it usually starts from the medial compartment and later it progresses to the lateral or patellofemoral or both the compartments. But the question is, why does it start in the medial compartment of the knee for which we are advocating high tibial osteotomy? Now, uh, there was a study published by Dr. Arun Mulaji from Bombay where they studied a normal population and they found that there is inherent virus in the Indian population. And this inherent virus is in about 35% of the population. And 50% had tibia vera. Tibia vera means that the medial proximal tibial angle is less than 87 degrees. There are various methods to uh, identify tibia vera. A medial proximal uh, tibial angle is one of them. The other parameter is tibial bone virus angle. This is an angle between the mechanical axis and line perpendicular to the epiphyseal line. If this angle is more than five degrees, this is tibia vera or a virus in the proximal metaphysis of tibia bone. So this is our normal population. Without osteoarthritis, they have this virus deformity. So that is why when the weight bearing occurs, the more of weight is there uh, passed through the medial compartment. And that is why it wears out earlier than the lateral. And that is why we have the medial osteoarthritis commoner than the lateral osteoarthritis. Now, for the treatment of osteoarthritis of knee, we have some non-pharmacological interventions, pharmacological interventions, and surgical interventions. And a variety of all the three things are available to us. And the guidelines for knee osteoarthritis treatment uh, 
start from self management medical therapy and lastly the surgical options if you look at the surgical options arthroscopy uh, is number 1 but it is hardly used for osteoarthritis today the second option is osteotomy and the last is arthroplasty or the knee arth replacement So, how do we select a surgical procedure for knee osteoarthritis? If we look at the picture on the left, medial compartment shows osteoarthritis, whereas the lateral is relatively normal. So, this patient would be suitable for high tibial osteotomy. If you look at the picture on the right, we have joint space reduction in both the lateral and the medial compartment. This patient would not be suitable for high tibial osteotomy. and on the uh, contrary it will be suitable for knee replacement or tkr but the problem is uh, in our country uh, <coughs> majority of the knee replacements are being done for medial compartment osteoarthritis and what if tkr is done in a case which is suitable for sto my submission is that it will amount to overkill now since this is an early osteoarthritis the age of the patient would be less than 60 and later on he will require revision the parameters which nobody talks is the lifestyle alteration and physical restriction that is imposed by tkr on these patients now this paper in the journal of osteoarthritis and cartilage Uh, shows what is the distribution of osteoarthritis in various compartments of the knee so if you look at the single compartment constitutes around 50% and the combination of medial compartment isolated medial compartment is 27 the combination of patellofemoral and uh, medial compartment is around 50% so that's the distribution of disease in the population but if you look at the usage of tkr and ukr that is not commensurate with the distribution of disease in various compartments of the knee the usage of the tkr and ukr is much higher than the uh, distribution of the disease in different compartments that's the reality and what is not told about the knee replacement when it is uh, given to the patient that there is a limited longevity of the prosthesis imposes many physical restrictions and altered lifestyle for the patient ideally a tkr implant should outlive the patient and this is possible if tkr is done after the age of 60 to 65 years but if it is done earlier than that revision surgery is required it also imposes physical restriction patient cannot squat cannot sit cross legged running and sports uh, are advised to be not done by the patient it imposes a uh, altered lifestyle patient cannot sit cross legged for puja or sajda for namaz which is a uh, important thing in our society patient cannot sit on floor for various social gatherings professions like gardening and farming have to abandon and a person who is living in the city he has to run after a bus or a train now that is also not possible after total knee replacement so he has to change his lifestyle uh, which is not acceptable to many people so who is best suited for a tkr he is a elderly person more than 60 to 65 years of age and for him or uh, her the all the non operative measures have failed and there is bi compartment or tri compartment disease uh, in the knee which is uh, indicating that there is a late Uh, stage of the disease but if the age of the patient is less than 60 to 65 years only middle compartment is affected and non operative measures have failed this patient is more suited for high tibial osteotomy high tibial osteotomy provides good pain relief it imposes no restriction on activities and no change in the lifestyle it is much cheaper than the uh, tkr although the cost difference is not much after the capping of the cost of tkr by the government of india but however in the past the difference was much larger 
and it is more suited for Indian conditions where people like to squat, sit cross-legged, do puja and do namas. The aim of high tubular startme is to provide pain relief, decrease the rate of progression of disease. You cannot stop the progression altogether, but you decrease the rate of progression. It promotes osteochondral repair in the medial compartment and it delays the need for replacement of the knee joint. And this delay can be uh, there for the whole lifetime of the patient. Now, why are we talking about HTO? Is it a new procedure? No, it is a very old procedure. It is much older than TKR. If you look at the history of HTO, uh, osteotomies were done uh, for a very long time, but the modern HTO was started by Jackson and Waugh in 1961. It was later popularized by Coventry, who was working in Mayo Clinic, and he was advocating close wedge high tubular osteotomy. At that time, the close wedge high tubular osteotomy was done by visual judgment. Proximal tibia was cut, a wedge was removed. The wedge was, uh, the distal fragment was moved laterally to close the wedge. And the plaster was given. Uh, minimal implants were used, either K wires or some uh, tangent wiring were done. And later, at the, if there was no implant, uh, the wedging of plaster was also done later in the uh, follow up to uh, some, do some minor correction in the angulation of the limb. But the results are variable uh, because there was varying degree of correction uh, because it was done by just visual judgment. So the outcome was very variable. People uh, had doubts about its efficacy. Uh, it was not very predictable at that time. And when TKR and UKR uh, came, they were sort of the last uh, nails in the coffin of the HTO and the HTO became less popular. But the revival of HTO was uh, done by uh, Pudu, who was working in Rome. He advised one wedge osteotomy uh, and he used an ankle stable implant. And there were many other contributors to the revival of HTO. But the important thing was people started emphasizing on the accuracy in the correction of al alignment of the limb. And they found that this, the correction was the key element in the success of the HTO. If you look at the history of uh, HTO, uh, in the early 1960s, uh, Jackson and Walk introduced it, Coventry popularized it. He even uh, made a Coventry staple in 65. Muller started using a T-plate uh, for the osteotomy. Then Fujisawa described the Fujisawa point, uh, describing what should be the weight-bearing line, what point should it pass through. Dugdale uh, talked about some calculations, pre-operative uh, calculations. Magyar talked about hemicalitosis, that means slow correction using external fixators. And then Pudu in Rome uh, described a uh, open wedge osteotomy using a uh, locking plate or an internal fixator. And this procedure was later modified in Germany by Stabli and Lomenhofer. And what we have today is the modern uh, HTO open wedge osteotomy by Stabli and Lovenhofer. So if you look at the historical uh, osteotomy, which is before 1940, the technique was uh, rudimentary and variable, and there were uh, complications like loss of correction, infection, stiffness, because all these were put in plaster. Then the uh, early modern years from 1940 to 2000 uh, year, people started uh, developing secure fixation technique, either using internal fixator or external fixator. They identified ideal corrective angle for the longevity of the procedure. And they had an uh, idea about pre planning. And even in this period, the overall survival rate of HTO was 90% 5 years, 77 to 78% at 10 years, and 71 at 15 years. So even in this time, uh, HTO had good outcome. 
And then now after year 2000, we have a resurgence of uh, open wedge STO and we had fixed angular stable uh, implants, uh, different kind of plates are available today. And uh, the procedure which was done using external fixator, either ring fixator or tubular fixators, now the patient did not have the hassles of some uh, plates, uh, rods and wires going through his knee externally. Rehabilitation was uh, started earlier to reduce stiffness. Even computer navigation techniques came. And the issue procedure was done for various other disorders besides osteoarthritis in the medial compartment, like articular cartilage problem and meniscus problem. So that's the history of HTO uh, in summary. So we know now that HTO is not a new procedure, but it has evolved. It has been made more accurate and predictable. So is today HTO an abandoned procedure? Well, my answer is it's not an abandoned procedure. On the contrary, the surgeons and the physicians have taken a Walmart-like approach. So what is Walmart-like approach? Now, if you go to a supermarket, the, thung, uh, the items or the commodity which is to be sold early by the supermarket is exhibited in the passageway. It is exhibited at the eye level of a person and rest of the things are in the far corners. They are either above the eye level or below the eye level. So the surgeons and the physicians have advocated TKR and UKR very aggressively and they have stopped talking about HTO. So they, they are uh, suggesting HTO only when the patient demands it. There are only a few people who are uh, uh, advocating on their own. Why are we talking about today? Because more talk means more action. And in this webinar, we would like to re-emphasize that TKR is not suitable for everybody. Uh, HTO is a very good option in the middle osteoarthritis of knee. And today when we have the new techniques of HTO with the modern implants, the results are very good and predictable. So when we do HTO, we have to do some analysis and planning. And the issues which concern a surgeon is, is there a deformity in which bone is the deformity, in which part of the bone is the deformity, and why to correct it, and where to perform the osteotomy, what is the prerequisites and contraindication, and how to do it, and how much the correction. So we'll discuss each and every point uh, in detail. So to decide about a deformity, we should have an objective parameter. We should be able to quantify the deformity and it should be reproducible and very objective. It's not subjective. For that, we use the parameter of mechanical axis and anatomical axis. The mechanical axis is a line which is passing through the center of the hip to the center of the ankle joint and in a normal knee, it passes through the center of the knee. This is the mechanical axis. Whereas the anatomical axis of a femur is a mid-diaphyseal line uh, in the femur and the mid-diaphyseal line in the tibia. In the tibia, the mechanical axis and the anatomical axis are same, whereas it is different in the femur. Then we talk about mechanical axis deviation. Mechanical axis deviation is the perpendicular distance from the mechanical axis to the center of the knee joint. If you draw a mechanical axis, uh, normally it should pass to the center, but if it passes medial to the center of the knee joint, it indicates a varus, and if it is lateral, it indicates a valgus. And since the normal population has also some varus, the varus which is considered pathological is when the medial axis deviation is more than 15 millimeters on the medial side. That means, the weight-bearing line passes more than 15 millimeters from the center of the knee joint. That's considered to be a pathological virus. Otherwise, it's a physiological virus. So we need to have a weight-bearing X-ray from hip to ankle to determine whether this patient has got a virus or not. And how to take this X-ray? The patient has to be standing. 
bearing uh, equal weight on both the limbs the petal should be facing anteriorly and that requires some internal rotation of the limb and the x-ray has to be taken on a single cassette it is not pasting of the different x-rays three x-rays from top to bottom and you make a big one it is a single x-ray that's how you take this x-ray then uh, we have to decide in which bone is the deformity conventionally it is uh, a tibia when there is a varus deformity and it is femur when there is a valgus deformity but again we need to be very objective and scientifically we have to use mechanical axis uh, to be very uh, accurate and scientific about it now besides the mechanical axis we also draw a line which is parallel to the tibial condyle and the femoral condyles of the knee joint now if the angle which is formed by the mechanical axis and the line tangential to the femoral condyle which is the angle which is formed by the uh, these two lines is mechanical lateral distal, distal femoral angle if it is more than 90 degrees that means the varus is in the femur and similarly you have an angle between the mechanical axis of the tibia and a line which is tangential to the tibial condyles when this angle is less than 85 degrees which is the medial proximal tibial angle is less than 85 the varus is in tibia and this is called the malalignment test that determines what is the site of uh, the bone where the which is the offending uh, bone in the varus deformity and another situation could be a ligament laxity we draw the uh, lines tangential to the femoral condyle and the tibial condyle normally the, this angle is called the joint line convergence angle and the value is less than 2 degrees if it is opening on the lateral side and it's more than 2 degrees that means the cause of the ligament laxity on the lateral side so in the varus deformity if we have a medial proximal tibial angle is an 85 degree that means the deformity lies in tibia if the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle is more than 90 degrees that means the deformity lies in the femur if both the angles are abnormal that means the deformity is contributed by both tibia and femur to give you an example we have a varus deformity on the right lower limb of this patient now we have to decide where is the deformity either in the tibia or in the femur so we have to draw some lines as shown in this figure we draw the mechanical axis and the medial axis deviation is pathological that means this is the varus deformity then we draw the draw the mechanical axis of femur and tibia and lines parallel to the tangential to the condyles of the tibia and femur and we find that the medial proximal tibial angle is normal whereas the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle is more than 90 degrees so the problem lies in the femur and not in the tibia even though this is a varus deformity so that gives an objective criteria to determine the offending bone in a varus deformity then the question arises which part of the bone uh, conventionally it is distal femur uh, for uh, valgus and proximal tibia for a varus but again we have to be objective we can use either anatomical or mechanical axis it is much easier to use anatomical axis to determine which part of the bone is offending we draw anatomical axis for each segment of the bone and we draw a normal proximal tibial angle and a normal uh, lateral distal uh, tibial angle and find the cora so these are the various situations where we have a varus in the tibia when we draw a uh, anatomical axis we find the deformity lies in the diaphysis this is the cora cora is the center of rotation of angulation this is the usual situation in uh, medial osteoarthritis we find that the deformity lies in the proximal tibia this is a situation where the varus is because of the deformity in the lower tibia and this is a situation where the deformity lies in the diaphysis and also in the lower tibia so we have to know what is the site of the deformity it is not always proximal tibia 
Then the question arises, why should we correct this deformity? Now, this is an X-ray of a patient who had vitamin D resistant rickets and a virus deformity on both the lower limbs. This is a, a young girl who has a virus deformity on the left side because of some childhood injuries. This is a middle-aged uh, person with medial compartment osteoarthritis. So, in these two cases, the reason is cosmesis. Before the onset of osteoarthritis, we have to correct the deformity. And in this, the reason is pain after the onset of osteoarthritis. So, there could be two different reasons for doing a osteotomy. In an age group before the onset of osteoarthritis, the reason is cosmesis and also a preventive. That means to prevent the onset of osteoarthritis later in the lifetime of this patient. Then the question is where to perform the osteotomy? Uh, the answer is it is uh, same as we do in the Lizro, as or as close to Cora as possible. Now, if you don't, don't do uh, at a site which is at the Cora or very close to the Cora, we create another deformity. Now, for a medial compartment osteoarthritis, the Cora is at or very close to the joint line. So, we do a osteotomy in the proximal metaphysis. The additional or the fringe benefit of this is that we have better healing in the cancellous bone. And if you're doing a close wedge osteotomy, the petal tendon provides compression and a better healing for this osteotomy. We have different types of osteotomies, a close wedge osteotomy, which is a lateral based close wedge, a open osteotomy, which is a medial based open wedge or a dome osteotomy. The open wedge osteotomy can be done with a graft or without a graft. We can also have a hemi close and a hemi open uh, osteotomy and we can do this osteotomy using uh, internal fixator or external fixators. But the bottom line is all these osteotomies aim to achieve the same mechanical axis after correction. There is no difference in that. Now how to select a open versus closed wedge osteotomy? Broadly it's the surgeon's choice. And both the osteotomies give equally good results. It's basically a surgeon's choice. If you talk about a closed wedge osteotomy, it was popularized by Coventry who worked in Mayo Clinic. This is an osteotomy uh, done uh, through the cancellous bone to the cora. Now in the middle compart uh, compartment, the cora lies somewhere here and you are doing a very close, you can't do osteotomy at the joint line. So you are doing a osteotomy uh, very close to the cora. There have been many modifications of the procedure which was described by Coventry. Uh, people started using implants. Uh, there have been different types of osteotomies for the fibula, but it is very logical that you correct a bony varus. You can also uh, tighten the LCL by reattachment when working on the lateral side of the knee. We remove a lateral based wedge. The gap is closed and traditionally minimal or no implants are used and a POP cast is given. The issues with Coventry uh, procedure is that we have a proximal shift of the t to porosity producing a pseudo petlialta, but that's not a problem for the patient in a majority of the cases. The issue is a truncation of the proximal tibia. Truncation is something like this. Now, this is issue is does not uh, concern the patient or the surgeon who does the uh, HTO, but this concerns a person who would be doing a TKR later on. They find it difficult to put the implants in this type of TPR later on. Another uh, issue with the close wedge me is that you are stuck with the wedge that you have removed. You cannot change the size of the wedge once you have removed this wedge. So there are chances of under correction and over correction with this closed wedge osteotomy. Another issue is that you require a fibula osteotomy either in the diaphysis or very proximal and near the head. And when you are using uh, just a POP and not any internal implant, the knee mobilization is difficult 
it is uh, delayed. But a close wedge osteotomy is mandatory when you have a pre existing betula baha or there is a need for lateral orthotomy for some reason or a posterior slope has to be decreased. The tibial slope has to be decreased. It, it, it may be there when you have an ACL injury and you need to decrease the slope, then you have to do a close wedge osteotomy and just by uh, Decreasing the uh, slope, you can take care of the medial compartment osteoarthritis and the ACL injury at the same time. You may not need to reconstruct the ACL uh, in this situation with a closed wedge osteotomy. Now, if you look at the failure, the cause of failure of uh, HTO, it is mainly the loss of valgus correction uh, because no implants were being used. And when you have a large correction, there is uh, invariably a fracture of the opposite cortex. So this uh, correction has to be maintained till the time the osteotomy unites. And this is the crux in the HTO. So you need to have a very stable fixation uh, <coughs> you're doing the HTO. Otherwise, there are chances of loss of valgus correction. Now, open wedge osteotomy was introduced in 1987. It has better adjustability. You can titrate the opening of the wedge. You have no truncation of proximal tibia. There is no problem of patella alta. And it can be done using internal fixator or a locking plate or using external fixator, ring uh, fixator or tubular fixator. So the problems of uh, close wedge osteotomy are mostly overcome by open wedge. Uh, since you can uh, titrate the opening of the open wedge, accurate correction is possible. It is easier, it is faster because you are cutting tibia at only one point. You're not cutting the fibula. No truncation of the proximal tibia is there. And since you are using some implants, either internal or external, early mobilization is possible. Now, why this open wedge osteotomy is uh, possible now? The answer is that now you have a pre-molded angle-stable implants. Various types of angle-stable implants are available, which are pre-molded. You don't have to bend them. And they provide a very good initial stability. And this stability is continued till the osteotomy unites. So you don't have any loss of correction with these implants and that is why you have accurate correction of the deformity and more predictable results with these implants. Uh, how does HTO work? The answer is it has both a mechanical effect and a biological effect. Uh, you shift the mechanical axis from the medial to the lateral compartment. We unload the medial compartment and so the pain is relieved on the medial side. The biological effect is you decompress the medullary hypertension. Now, uh, when we when I say it decompress the medullary hypertension, it sounds very uh, imaginative or uh, not real. But I'll give an example. Uh, when we do a core decompression in avascular necrosis, the main aim of core decompression is relief of pain. And the relief of pain is by the decreasing the hypertension, the venous hypertension in the bone. That's one of the reasons uh, of pain relief, uh, the, the main reason for pain relief in AVN by core decompression. Uh, to subst substant substantiate this evidence, I present you this uh, case report, which was published in Journal of Arthroscopy a uh, long time back in the year 2001. Now, there were surgeons from Cuba who were not doing a formal osteotomy for uh, the osteoarthritis of knee. They were just uh, using saw to just cut the bone partially in the tibia, in the femur, and even in the petula wherever the site of osteoarthritis was there. And they found even just by cutting the bone partially, 
they could achieve pain relief and the mechanism was relief of medullary hypertension the third benefit of hto is that the medial meniscus extrusion which occurs in osteoarthritis that is relieved that means the medial meniscus normally the outer border of medial meniscus is in line with the tibial condyle and the femoral condyle on the medial side this is extrusion now this moves back when you do a valgus osteotomy or high tibial osteotomy in medial compartment osteoarthritis so when this meniscus moves in you have some relief of pain that the third mechanism so what are the prerequisites for hto or uh, indication or a patient selection that the patient's age should be uh, preferably less than 60 but 60 is not a, cut, uh, a sacrosanct cut of figure the varus should be less than 15 it should be a pure medial osteoarthritis with a metaphyseal varus the contraindications is a bi compartment or a tri compartment osteoarthritis or a isolated lateral compartment osteoarthritis varus more than 15 flexion contracture more than 10 degrees range of motion less than 90 degrees bone loss either on femur or tibia or both that's a contraindication and a subluxation more than 1 cm if you look at the isacos guideline isacos is a society for arthroscopy and knee surgery an ideal patient uh, for hto would be a patient with isolated medial joint line pain age 40 to 60 bmi less than 30 high demand person but no running or jumping mine alignment less than 15 metaphyseal varus full range of motion a normal lateral and patellofemoral component no cupula that means the bone loss normal ligament balance non smoker and some level of pain tolerance but the same guidelines said that the hto can also be done if you have a flexion contracture less than 15 there is a previous infection in the knee joint the patient may be less than 40 or more than 60 to 70 so up to 70 you can easily do uh, hto uh, you can also do hto when you have either a acl or plc or pcl insufficiency you can incorporate change of slope in the sto and do it uh, to uh, counterbalance the ligament deficiency also you can also do it in moderate patellofemoral arthritis and in a person who wishes to continue all sports but it is contraindicated in bi compartment disease a flexion contracture more than 25 obese patient and meniscectomy in the compartment which is to be loaded that means if you have a lateral meniscectomy done for a patient you can't do sto so what does sto do it shifts the mechanical axis from medial to lateral how much to shift uh, to a point which is around 62% of the tibial width and the accuracy determines the clinical outcome it is the accuracy of the initial correction and maintenance of this correction which determines the clinical outcome so the goals for sto and varus deformity is shift the medial uh, weight bearing axis from medial to lateral to achieve 3 to 5 degree of mechanical valgus 8 to 10 degrees of anatomical valgus so that the weight bearing line passes through 60 to 66% of the tibial width which is the fujisawa point so we are opening the medial wedge with the lamina spreader you can titrate the opening of it and you can change the opening of the wedge till the weight bearing line or the mechanical axis from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle joint passes through the fujisawa point so this is a pre operative x ray on the left side the mechanical axis passes outside the knee joint on the medial side and after the osteotomy it passes to the fujisawa point another case the mechanical axis passes outside the knee joint and after the osteotomy through the fujisawa point now how much to open up during the surgery now calculation of the wedge size is important for a closing wedge osteotomy 
it is less important when you're doing a opening wedge of short me can you can always fine tune your opening of the wedge under the image intensifier so the methods which are described are coventry method the noise method and the minyasi method three methods are there now in the coventry method it is based on the anatomical axis of the lower limb the angle of the wedge is equal to the planned anatomical axis minus the preoperative anatomical axis if suppose the patient has a preoperative 4 degree of arras and you want to achieve 8 degree of valgus it will be 8 minus 4 but this 4 will be minus 4 because uh, you're talking uh, taking valgus as positive and varus as negative so your angle should be 12 degrees after the your wedge should have an angle of 12 degrees but when you're using this method you should have the angle guide intraoperatively on the table to measure the angle of the wedge not everybody has this angle guide the other method is that you calculate the the size of the base of the wedge which is side b when you are uh, in the coventry method so if this is the angle a on the medial side the tangent of a is base of our hypotenuse so the base would be the tangent of the angle into the h i and this is the width of the tibial condyle so that's another method that you put one wire here and at a measured or predetermined distance you put another wire and you remove this pre-calculated wedge for this method you don't need an angle guide the noise method is based on mechanical axis passing through the Fujisawa point. You draw the lines on the whole limb X-ray, center of the hip to the Fujisawa point, Fujisawa point to the center of the angle, and whatever angle is formed by these two lines, that determines the angle of the osteotomy. It can also be done on paper tracing. You cut the template and rotate it till the overlap of the paper determines the angle and this angle or this angle determines the angle which you have to achieve intraoperatively. Now this is based through the paper tracing. The other popular method is a Minyasi method. It is based on mechanical axis passing through the Fujisawa point. So if you have this whole limb x-ray you pass a line from the center of the hip to the Fujisawa point and extend it at a point which is at the same distance, a uh, same level at the center of the angle. From the site of the proposed cora, you draw a line to the center of the ankle joint and center from this point to the proposed virtual site. And the angle which is formed will determine the angle which you have to remove from the lateral side. This is for the closed wedge method. For the open wedge, again, you have to do the same thing. This is the line passing through the center of the hip to the Fujisawa point and extend it down at the same level at the virtual A. This is the Kora on the, when you're doing an open wedge, the Kora comes on the lateral side. From the Kora, you draw, draw a line to the center of the ankle, center of the virtual A, and this angle is the angle that you have to achieve at the open wedge osteotomy. So again, uh, this is the pre-operative X-ray and a post-operative, and the line passes through the Fujisawa point post-operatively. Now, how do we do? What are the steps for medial open wedge high table osteotomy? Now, there could be many methods of doing it, approaching it. Or cutting the bone but i'll tell you what i do so this is the x-ray with the medial compartment osteoarthritis and these are the lines that we have drawn now if you do draw a mechanical axis center of the hip to the center of the ankle it is outside the knee joint so that is definitely a virus deformity with the loss in the medial compartment joint space you draw a mechanical axis of the hip uh, or the femur and the tibia 
and you draw a line parallel to the joint uh, to tangent to the femoral condyles and the tangent to the tibial condyles and you find that the medial proximal tibial angle is abnormally low whereas the lateral distal femoral angle is normal so this patient is suitable for hto now various incisions have been described uh, some people use a small straight incision small oblique incision small horizontal incision now this line indicates the joint line and i use a l shaped incision and we raise a full thickness skin flap that includes the uh, the subcutaneous fat and we leave the periosteum uh, and the pes on the tibia we cut the soft tissues at a point which is parallel in a line which is parallel to the proximal margin of pes and serranus and we cut the mcl also transversely and we put a homans retractor there and we erase the popliteus muscle from the back of the tibia uh, so that the neurovascular bundle is very well protected uh, by the intervening uh, popliteus muscle when we are cutting the bone we make a proximal cut here and i all length and back underneath we also take a small incision distally so that the pes from this is released because when you opening the wedge the pes become very tight and you have to release the uh, attachment of the pes from the proximal tibia we pass a wire from the medial side to the lateral side and this is the site where the tibia changes the angle it corresponds to the proximal end of the fibula head you pass a wire there and at this position you can see two lines on the medial tibial condyle so you just flex the knee by keeping a, a a roll under the knee joint so that on image you see just a one sharp line of the medial tibial condyle you pass another wire which is parallel to this so that on image you see only one wire as a image so you see two wires here one wire here and this is the image with two wires and this is the one line of the medial tibial condyle that determines the slope of the proximal tibia the posterior slope then you plan a osteotomy which is like this now when you are going the osteotomy like this remember you have to protect the patella tendon and at the same time you don't have to go inside the knee joint so these are the two wires this is my homan at the sorry something happened this is not from me this is not from me okay are we at the same slide so you don't have to uh, go inside the knee joint at the same time you have to protect the patellar tendon and for this uh, we use saw and osteotomes but dr mittal you are not audible Doctor Mittal, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Is it okay now? Yes, yes. So you have to use a saw blade, which is not from the TKR set. You have to use a saw blade, uh, which is much thinner, much smaller in length, much smaller in width, and it's much thinner. And your osteotomes are also much thinner and sharper. Uh, 
Oh, something has happened here. Yeah. Now you use the osteotome and saw to cut along the wires. Now the important precaution is that you don't enter the knee joint with your saw and osteotomes. So you have to ensure that you place your guide wires correctly. The osteotomy is done below the guide wires so that the wires prevent the entry of saw and osteotomes into the knee joint. And your uh, thin and sharp saw blade is and osteotomes are used. And you go slowly, don't hammer it vigorously. It will create hydrogenic fractures. To prevent hydrogenic fractures, you have to use uh, small blows with less of force. And after doing this biplanar osteotomy, you put in a laminar spreader and you open your osteotomy. The important precaution is that you have to place the laminar spreader in the posterior part of the medial tibia, not anterior. This is the anterior, this is the posterior. You always place it posterior. You place this posterior so that the slope of the proximal tibia does not change. And the opening of the osteotomy is titrated by taking images, center of the hip, center of the ankle, and then you see the Fujisawa point. If it's passing through that, it's okay. Once you are decided that the opening of the wedge is okay, uh, you can notice that the opening of the wedge is more posterior and less anterior. That should be the normal thing. It should never be more anterior and less posterior or equal anterior and posterior. Otherwise, the slope of the proximal tibia will change. At this time, you can close the soft tissues here. You place your tomofix on the tibia. Fix it provisionally uh, with a drill and see that the lower part in the proximal, the lower hole in the proximal segment and the upper hole in the distal segment, they are on the bone. They are not in the wedge side. You have to ensure that. And you pass the holes in the proximal segment. And after uh, passing in holes, uh, screws in the uh, proximal segment, you put it on the distal segment. And then you check the alignment again after the plate application. At times, your view would be like this. This is without valgus stress because at this time, the patient is lying supine. This is not a weight-bearing position. The weight-bearing position or the actual situation when the patient is walking can be simulated by giving a small valgus stress. So if you achieve this, this is good. After putting the plate, you check for slope, you check for screw position, and also you check for screw penetration in the tibiofemoral joint. If your screws are long, it can very easily penetrate the tibiofibular joint because that is not seen in the AP view. You always see that thing in the oblique views. So you have to take those views to ensure that your screws do not penetrate in the tibiofemoral joint. The direction of the screw in the tomofix is from uh, anteromedial to posterior lateral. To give an example, this is a 50-year-old lady who is an OBG doctor, has bilateral medial compartment osteoarthritis. Now, this lady uh, was not very convinced about the HTO. So she went, underwent left HTO as a trial. And she said she will not come back to me if she is not happy with HTO. But uh, eventually she came back for the other side and we did a bilateral HTO for this patient. And this is the alignment we achieved post-op. This is a 45-year lady who had limited walking after ipsilateral uh, shaft of femur. You can see some old surgery being done here and she has loss of joint space here. We did a opening by just start me. Some other implant was used by me and this is the correction after the surgery. 
This is bilateral medial compartment arthritis in a 52-year-old lady. She was unable to walk even half a kilometer. She had failed medical treatment. Range of motion was 0 to 110. And she wanted a bilateral simultaneous HTO. And we did with a Tomofix uh, bilateral at the same setting. Now, this was an elderly male, 65-year-old male, national level hockey player, failed conservative treatment, and he wanted to preserve his knee. We did a HTO. Since he was a smoker, we put a TCP wedge for him. And this was the alignment we achieved postoperatively. Besides the knee pain, uh, the additional benefits of HTO is that the gait improves because you have corrected the virus, you have relieved the pain, the gait improves. The spinal alignment also improves because you have corrected the virus, you have corrected the, even the ankle deformity, your abductors are working in a better situation, your spinal uh, alignment improves. And if there is an ankle osteoarthritis, that also improves because your ankle is now in a better position. Now, there are some frequently asked questions by people uh, and they raise some doubts about HTO. The first is, will it cause a lateral compartment osteoarthritis if you are shifting the weight bearing axis from medial to lateral? The answer is no. It took 50 years for medial compartment osteoarthritis to develop. So it will take another 50 years for lateral compartment. And by the time the patient had would have lived his full life. So uh, the answer is no. But the precaution is your osteotomy should not be overcorrected. It should be uh, accurate osteotomy. Then only this condition will hold true. If you overcorrect, it will definitely cause lateral compartment, compartment osteoarthritis. Is HTO good for complete cartilage loss on the medial side? Yes, the answer is yes. Multiple authors have shown that if you have a complete bone on bone or kissing lesion on the medial side, HTO is good. It works very well. And Koshino has set, uh, uh, shown very well that the function improves and even the cartilage regenerates on the medial side. These are his uh, intraoperative pictures, pre and post-op. He has shown that the cartilage also regenerates when there is complete cartilage loss on the medial side. The other uh, question is, is it a stopgap arrangement? Strictly speaking, yes. But this gap is long enough when done accurately, when HTO is done accurately. And it is long enough to avoid TKR later on. Even TKR is not a permanent solution. It also has a lifespan. A lifespan, it lasts usually around 15 years. So the same question which is asked for HTO can also be asked for TKR. But people don't ask for it. People ask only for HTO. Is it backed by long-term studies? Yes. Answer is yes. Koshino has said, uh, shown that there is 97% uh, survival, survival at 7 years, 95 at 10, and 87 at 15 years. Other authors have also shown uh, Glosser 94% at 5 years, 80% at 10 years. Uh, Akizuki has uh, shown that 97 at 10 years, 90 at 15 years. Uh, Tang has shown around 90% 5 years. 75 at 10 years and 67 at 15 years. So the results are fairly good by number of authors. So it's not a single person study. Multiple authors have shown that. Now, if you look at the overall survival of HTO, it is around 99% at five years, 94 at 10 years, and around 85 at 15 years. Now, this was a study published in 2019, not very old study. Does it compromise future TKR? The answer is no. There is no difference between the outcomes of a primary TKR and TKR done after HTO. And multiple reports have shown that. On the contrary, uh, it makes TKR easier when the deformity, the virus deformity is not to be corrected by the surgeon. The question is, uh, 
uh, that knee replacement can be done bilaterally at the same setting. Is it possible for HTO? The answer is yes, it can be done. But patients who undergo simultaneous uh, HTO have a higher chance of a need for blood transfusion and that holds good true for the knee replacement also. Can HTO cause patellofemoral problems? Now, the position of the patella changes whether you do a open wedge or a closed wedge, but it never causes a patellofemoral problem. Uh, the report in 2021 says that you have a patella infra after open wedge osteo, uh, HTO, but it does not cause any clinical problem or cartilage problem. Is it suitable in old age? Uh, in 2013, it was told that age of the patient does not have to be taken into consideration for the indication of high tibial osteotomy. This is the condition of the knee that has to be taken. In 2017, a study was published which showed that the age did not influence the clinical and the rheological outcome after HTO. And the study had two groups, one more than 65 and other less than 65. And the results were same in both the groups. And this study in 2019, which said there was no significant difference in the survival rate of HTO between the two groups divided by the age and the division was less than 64 and more than 65. So the age is not a consideration for TKR. You can easily do up till 70 years of age. Now, this was a question which was asked and it was repeatedly asked, is the benefit of HTO unpredictable? Yes, it was unpredictable when it was done by just the visual alignment. Uh, but who will benefit or not? That is also unpredictable, people say. But uh, first of all, that's not true. But if you can uh, show that the patient is getting benefit with the valgus unloading brace, this patient would definitely have uh, pain relief with the HTO. You can also give a lateral heel wedge to this patient and if this patient says that he has pain relief in the medial knee pain, then this patient will definitely have pain relief after HTO. So you can predict who will benefit and who will not. Other question is, uh, if patellofemoral osteoarthritis is present along with a medial compartment osteoarthritis, can you do STO? Yes, you can do if it is just mild to moderate. Obviously, if it is very severe and the predominant symptom is anterior knee pain, your STO will not benefit the patient. But if the predominant symptom is medial knee pain and on X-ray, it is only mild osteoarthritis in the patellofemoral, you can do STO. Then there are some issues for the HTO uh, for the surgeon. What implant to be used? Is biplanar better than the uniplanar? Is it always uniplanar and unifocal? And should it be combined with arthroscopy? Should it be combined with any injections? So let's talk about the implant. Now you can see two types of plate and one external fixator. So it is at times uh, it does. The first of all, it does not matter what implant you use. You can use anything. The ultimate thing is what mechanical axis you achieve after the surgery. And whatever fixation you do, it has to be very stable and stable till the osteotomy heals. It does not matter what implant you use. It, is, it can be a surgeon's choice, uh, whatever he's comfortable with. Some people are doing... Uh, with external fixator, tubular fixator, some people are doing with a uh, circular fixator, some people are using locking plates, They're equally good. And at times it is determined by patient's factor. So I'll give you some examples uh, when it is determined by patient's factor. Now, if you look at this, the whole medial skin is scarred. It is very difficult or uh, say unsafe to put a plate medially. So we used a tubular fixator did a HTO and achieve good correction and union. Now, this is a patient of a giant cell tumor, which was operated by curettage and bone grafting, but he developed a varus deformity. And he is a barber by profession. Uh, he says that he cannot stand. 
uh, for his, his profession because of pain. So we did a biopsy from this area. We did not see, see uh, show any recurrence of the tumor, the giant cell tumor. And this was his scanogram, standing scanogram. We did a osteotomy using a tubular fixator because everything was scarred on the medial side. We had undergone a curettage and bone grafting on the medial side. And this is the alignment we achieved after the surgery. And this is after removal of the fixator. Now he has pain relief and he has gone back to his profession and he is doing hair cutting uh, very easily now. Should it be biplanar or uniplanar? Uh, studies have shown that the biplanar osteotomy has more surface area, so it heals faster. And since it's a biplanar, it is more stable. Now, a virus deformity in the knee uh, can be uh, associated with deformities in other sites also. Now, this patient has a virus deformity since childhood. Now, if you see a virus deformity, which is starting in the childhood, uh, these are often associated with inter internal torsional deformity of the tibia also, uh, which is seen in this picture. So you have to correct the rotational deformity and a virus deformity at the same time. Uh, you can either do two osteotomies, one for the rotational and one for the virus. But if you do a, a oblique osteotomy like this, and fix it by any means, you can correct both the deformities at the same time. You cannot ignore the rotational deformity when you are doing a virus deformity correction. And this uh, cora is also not in the proximal interfaces, it is much lower down. This is the x-ray I showed you earlier, vitamin D resistant rickets. Without the uh, presence of osteoarthritis, it's a cosmetic problem. If you can see, you have two cora in the uh, femur and the cora in the tibia is lower down with the rotational component. So we did an oblique osteotomy in the tibia lower down and two osteotomies in the femur on this side and one osteotomy in the femur on this side. So you can have a virus deformities with more than one focus and in more than one plane. So identify these before you decide to do anything. This is a post-traumatic deformity with the medial compartment pain. He had a virus and a recurvatum. So you have to correct this also. We did a tibial tuberosity uh, osteotomy and then a high tibial osteotomy to correct the deformity. We opened it on the medial and anterior side. Should it be combined with arthroscopy? It is not mandatory. Arthroscopy can be helpful to ensuring that it's a monocompartment pathology. You can manage the meniscal tears and you can do microfractures. But literature has shown that you don't have any major added advantage of doing arthroscopy with HTO with the, in the presence of medial compartment osteoarthritis. So you can ensure that, that this is a bone on bone on the medial side, whereas the lateral compartment is normal. You can do micro fractures and manage the meniscal tear, but this is, this is not mandatory. Should it be combined with injection, hyaluronic acid or PRP? You may combine, but uh, the signs of hyaluronic acid and PRP is still not exact signs. We don't know the exact dose uh, preparation. It is still empirical. The, we don't know the timing, dosage, and the preparation of PRP. But the bottom line is no major side effects or complication of these injections. You may combine. One major issue is comparing HTO and UKR because the same the patients who are suitable for HTO are also suitable for UKR most of the time. So if you look at the literature, Journal of Arthroplasty, a systematic review and meta-analysis, it says that there is no difference in the functional results in UKR and HTO. There is no difference in the survival of the two procedures. On the contrary, HTO has better range of motion. Another report from Journal of Arthroplasty, a meta-analysis, it says there is no difference in specific knee scores after the two procedures. There is no difference in complications and rates of revision and our range of motion is better in 
HTO. Another report from Journal of Orthoplasty and Meta-Analysis, it says that with correct patient selection, both HTO and UKR show effective and reliable results. Another report from Journal of Orthoplasty, it says that there is no difference between UKR and HTO in return to recreational activities and short-term clinical outcomes. Cochrane database, says there is no difference in the pain, function and gait after the two procedures. Another meta-analysis and systematic review, uh, it concluded that uh, it is they were unable to conclude either method is superior. Another report, Journal of Orthopedic Surgery, there was no difference in the outcome at 12 and 24 months. The HTO has better correction of mechanical access and HTO is the treatment of choice for younger and active patients. That's what the conclusion of this report. Now, this is a paper which showed the data from Australian and Swedish knee registries. And it talked about UKR in patients less than 65 years of age. It showed that the patient who are less than 65 have a higher rate of revision than the patients of 65 or more than 65. So the conclusion is UKR should not be done in younger patients. It should be done in patients more than 65 years of age. Uh, now, if you look at the closed wedge and the unique compartment, uh, closed wedge HTO and unique compartment knee arthroplasty, with similar demographics. It says there is no difference in the long-term survival between the two procedures. The failure in HTO is because of progression of medial compartment osteoarthritis because you cannot stop the rate of pro uh, the progress of HTO and when it becomes severe, the patient has pain, it fails. It's an indication of replacement. Whereas the failure in the UKR is because of the femoral component loosening. If you have a failure of HTO, you do a TKR, you use the usual primary implants and only a tibial stem to bypass the defect in the tibia. Whereas if you have a failure in the UKR and you do a TKR, you have to use a revision components and much thicker polythene. So the treatment of failure of HTO is much easier than the failure of treatment of UKR. Now, this was a surprise to me when I read this report that the mean time to return of sports so much earlier in STO, the mean time to return to professional activities so much, return, uh, much earlier in STO, and the number of people who are participating in impact sports were much higher in STO as compared to UKR. So, there is no reason for choosing UKR over HTO. There is no reason. Our colleagues from the orthoplasty group, they said that HTO is not suitable for bone-on-bone -bone lesion and you should do UKR. That was a message propagated by our colleagues from the arthroplasty field. And I started looking for it. And what I found was that the Oxford group said that the UKR should be reserved for bone on bone lesion. That means you should do a UKR only for end stage medial compartment osteoarthritis and not when the cartilage is still preserved. They said that. And this group did not comment about HTO. Whereas our colleagues in India, they interpreted in a wrong way. They said that UKR is good for bone and bone lesion and HTO is not good for bone and bone lesion. So it was a wrong interpretation of facts, which was mentioned outside India. And in India, it was interpreted in a wrong way. Studies have shown that HTO is a good option for osteoarthritis with kissing lesion. Kissing lesion means bone-on-bone -bone lesions. 
and the two group they had studied was with kissing lesion and without kissing lesion another study that sto is comparable to ukr in terms of clinical outcomes in kissing lesions and sto is a good alternative to ukr for medial compartment osteoarthritis accompanied by kissing lesions so for me there is no reason why one should choose ukr over sto there is no reason if you compare the two procedures the virus deformity is corrected in sto but it remains uncorrected or undercorrected in ukr you can do sto and correct less than 10 degree of flexion deformity whereas you cannot correct any flexion deformity in ukr you can do easily do sto in presence of acl deficiency and traditionally you cannot do ukr in presence of acl deficiency though reports are coming that you do acl and ukr so that's a bigger procedure than simple sto activity level is unrestricted in sto where it becomes restricted in ukr if sto fails revision to tkr is easy you use primary implants and at the most a tibial stem which is very easy whereas if a ukr fails revision to tkr is difficult you have to use revision implants and much thicker plastic spinal alignment improves in sto and it remains uncorrected in ukr ipsilateral ankle osteoarthritis improves in sto and remains un unimproved in ukr gait improves in sto because of pain relief and varus correction whereas in ukr the gait improves only because of pain correction pain relief so on if you count everything sto scores much over ukr now look at the data from uk national joint registry the place where the was originated Uh, if you look at this of time. okay i'll make it fast uh if you look at this registry they found that the 40% of 47% of knee osteoarthritis are eligible for ukr but the usage is only 5 to 8% and the failure rate of ukr is 3.2% more than that 3.2 uh, times that of tkr only the high volume centers report equal or better survival of ukr compared to tkr and this is a vicious cycle high failure of ukr is there and this reason they say is low volume and low proportion of ukr done after total arthroplasty so the remedy is you increase the usage of ukr and this leads to lower age threshold of ukr and these lower threshold uh, lower age people will do increased activity and they will have increased increased failure rate of ukr so that's the vicious cycle of ukr failures you have other indications for sto also if you have a malunion with varus or recurvate with or without recurvatum this is a post traumatic varus and you can do sto in this and you can correct the deformity and the pain you have a varus and recurvatum you do a medial opening wedge uh, with a more opening anteriorly with a bone graft you have a post traumatic varus and recurvatum this is the x ray i showed before also with tibial tuberosity or start me you can correct both the things you another case with varus and recurvatum with the sto you can correct everything with the previous surgery uh, this is the case i showed you before this is a final correction now this is another case a proximal tibia gct treated by bone grafting healed very well but complained of varus and medial knee pain we did a simple osteotomy uh, opening wedge on the medial side correct the deformity and if you see this is his function you cannot find out which knee is operated in this patient he has a normal gait a normal looking limb on both the sides it is only the x ray which will tell you which limb is operated 
So there are many indications for STO besides this. This is after post-trauma. You can change the slope in the cruciate ligament injury. This is chronic PCL with medial OA. We just did a HTO with more opening of the wedge anteriorly and did not do any PCL reconstruction in this case. So normal slope is around 10. Uh, you should not change uh, when you're doing for pure uh, medial OA. If ACL deficient, slope can be decreased by doing a closed wedge osteotomy. If PCL deficient, slope can be increased by doing an open wedge osteotomy. You can do it for uh, cosmetic reasons. I showed you this x-ray before. Uh, growth injury in the childhood. Correction achieved by a simple osteotomy. This the patient I have showed you before. And you can also do it after microfracture, mosaic plasty, and manifest transplant. They say when you unload the medial compartment, cartilage healing is better. The determinants of HTO outcome is age and grade of, uh, grade of osteoarthritis. Now, I think these two are related, age and grade. It is the only thing which is in the hand of surgeon is the tibiofemoral angle after the HTO. And this is achieved after careful planning, execution, and weight-bearing access passing through the Fujisawa point. Literature has shown that if you have a, a tibia vara, that means more than five degree angle, the results are better as compared to the case where the tibia vara is absent. So to conclude, HTO is a rational, logical, and a time-tested technique. It has good long-term results, allows understood activities, but you have to select the patients carefully and follow the technique. It needs precision and it does not burn bridges. The benefit of HTO is due to mechanical and biological reason. And you aim to pass the mechanical axis through the Fujiseva point of the surgery. It should be done at or close to Cora. And all method of osteotomy and fixation are equally good. And it can be done in many other conditions besides medial compartment osteoarthritis. It preserves the original knee. There is no activity restriction. It is easy to do. Needs careful planning and perfect execution. There are many methods of osteotomy and implants, but the basic principles remain the same. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mittal. So now we move on to the panel discussion. And we have Dr. Milin Chaudhary, Dr. Thakkar, and Dr. Uh, to help us do this. I will ask uh, Dr. Milin to give his opinion on the age for doing a STO. Well, firstly, congratulations, Professor Ravi Mittal, for a very comprehensive uh, coverage of the topic of STO. Very relevant, very germane. You've hardly left out anything. It's a wonderful talk. Thank you. So coming to the age of HTO, Professor Mittal mentioned that you know you can do it up to 65, sometimes up to 70. Um, obviously, we all know that there's this concept of physiological age and chronological age. So the physiological age, you know, Dr. Sanjay Rastogi looks young, uh, <laughs> much younger than his years. So, you know, similarly, a very young 80-year-old can certainly have a high tibial osteotomy. Uh, my, my friends and colleagues from Japan, of whom I'm extremely fond of, because I was, um, you know, Dr. Sanjay had the privilege of, you know, escorting Dr. Koshino when he came to Mumbai. He's had close relation with Professor Koshino. And now we, unfortunately, Professor Koshino is no more. He spoke about uh, patients whom he operated beyond the age of 80 regularly, because we all know that the Japanese have very good um, octogenarians and nonagenarians and centenarians. And now Professor Teramoto, uh, you know, has told us that he's operated on people who are 90 with a high tibial osteotomy. So judiciously, I think with the same indications that is the medial compartment osteoarthritis, a desire for good activity levels, you know, the lateral compartment being good and the patient being physically active and physiologically young, age, the chronological age should be less of an issue. Thank you. 
uh, there's one thing which I'd like to say about the role of uh, partial knee replacement. If only cartilage is lost and there is no bony deformity and there are no osteophytes and the patient is above 65 and the surgeon has vast experience, then it becomes an indication for doing a UKR. If the patient is young, he requires high activity level. If there are ligamentous instability, then it is better not to do it uh, partial knee replacement. What's your take on that, Dr. Millen? So the the I, I I beg your indulgence in answering this question about UKR and HTO. I think there is enough literature and enough industry support for UKR. The interesting takeaway from the HTO 360 conference we held last November, in which uh, a very prominent uh, professor from Delhi attended. Unfortunately, we missed you, and we missed Professor Mittal and Dinesh as well. Was that uh, he said that the intraarticular high tibial osteotomy could be considered akin to a UKR, and um, you know, so th there is this is the extent of my knowledge about UKR. All I can tell you is I am a little biased, quite honestly. Thirty-two years into different types of high tibial osteotomy, and I really I have not opened at all the chapter, the vast chapter of arthroplasty, whether it's partial or complete. So I feel that high tibial osteotomy, whether it's an intra-articular or other type, can do justice to the patients who are bone on bone with or without osteophytes, who are older and will get a good result. Um, you know, so um, re regardless of you know the, the classification that Professor Mittal has very you know nicely elaborated upon. To give a holistic view to the people who are also doing arthroplasty, but I am a dedicated knee preservation surgeon and I am unable to perform a unicornular knee, but I am able to give equally good results with a high degree of Very well said. Dr. Mittal wants to say something on that. Uh, sir, factually, I cannot say you are wrong. But I would say a person who is fit for UKR is also fit for HTO. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. But all patients who are fit for uh, HTO are not fit for UKR. That's the point. Well, so all patients are fit for HTO, but all patients are not fit for UKR. And everybody who is fit for UKR is fit for HTO. Correct. Am I right? <laughs> Am I right? Yes. That's good. But I think if uh, I give honest opinion, uh, suppose a senior citizen because uh, I realize after doing a numbers of high tibial osteotomy that uh, why it has uh, not is it can it could not dominate over the arthroplasty till so many years because uh, we all four Dr. Milin and Dr. Rastogi and myself are trying uh, since 10 to 15 years I think the first conference I have attended in 2010 I think Dr. Milin has organized still we could not come. Uh, uh, come across the arthroplasty. The one of the uh, the practical reason in this present era is arthroplasty is uh, can give quick results. That's the only attraction for the patients because they come back to the work uh, within fifteen or twenty days or so. While HTO patient will have uh, convincing results after uh, at least uh, three uh, at least three months. So that may be the reason why HTO has could not overcome the total knee or partial knee replacement. You have three fingers raised. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> to set the boundary, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Milin will give his opinion. <laughs> so if if you have patients coming to you early enough and you do a high tibial osteotomy, you know, with a mild deformity, early stage of the disease, I've seen this. And I've had, I've had orthopedic surgeons with mild deformities who came, came to me and got a HTO, started walking on the second day and went back home in 48 hours, drove 1100 kilometers to go back home. People are able to squat 
in one month after surgery, if all the wedge that you have to open is four or five or six or seven mm, it's an early stage osteoarthritis. So I wish to add to what you're saying, Dr. Dinesh, that if the patient comes to us at an early stage, their recovery and ability to go back to work is dramatically fast. I've had orthopedic surgeons who attended their OPD and started operating within a few weeks of the surgery. So I, um, so if they come early, they're going to get good early results. If they come late, then it'll take a little while longer. Uh, and I think the way to try compartment osteoarthritis is to a unicompartment arthritis. So everybody will have a medial compartment osteoarthritis and by compartment then try compartment. So why, if we are late in giving that opinion, then there's a problem. So we have to give opinion early. Dr. Mittal was saying something on this. So when we compare uh, STO and arthroplasty, uh, you cannot compare TKR to STO because TKR is for by and tri compartment mm -hmm. osteoarthritis. So when you're comparing, you have to compare with UKR. Mm -hmm. And a similar argument was given by uh, one of our orthopedic colleagues in a conference where I present, I was talking about STO. And that is the reason I, uh, I came back and looked at the literature and I put a slide what is the time to return to profession? What is the time to return to sports? And what is the time to return to impact sports? And that everything is less in STO as compared to UKR. I've given, I've shown that slide. So, and that slide is not from India. That slide comes from Germany. So this, and that is from the AO website also. Yes. And actually, the point is, if we have done a uh, biplanar uh, bi osteotomy and fixed with a tomofix, then the rehabilitation is functional from day one, like Dr. Millen said. Yes. You can so, make these patients um, stand, walk as tolerated right from the next day. So, literature also. Okay, I tell them to give the confidence that you are to toilet um, dependent not dependent on anybody for toilet activities, even on the day two when you go home. Correct. So that is correct. See, the literature also shows that the recovery is faster in uh, STO as compared to UKR, uh, but you can't compare STO. But actually, the reason why the reason things are not clear is because people keep quoting about the old closed wedge STO results with the open wedge current right. results. Correct. I think that's the uh, biggest hurdle. Correct. So we should sort of clarify that there are dif there's difference between open wedge and, and closed wedge, and the open wedge gives much better, quicker, better, faster results. Right. It's not just the open and the closed wedge. I'd say that this is modern HTO, which is yes. how it started. This is modern right. HTO. Yes. Not the <laughs> yes. Not the ancient HTO. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that is why. I showed the evolution of STO in my initial slides, how it has evolved and the thought process has evolved in STO. And the second slide was FEAR, false evidence appearing real. Absolutely. And let me, I'm getting uh, advertisements on my WhatsApp and emails regarding joint replacement by companies now. This was never happening before. And I never believed this, but when I was with false going to it, in US, they used to market this unique apartment directly to the patients. Mm -hmm. And everybody was doing with, and this led to poor results. It's well documented. This is uh, something which happened in COVID that you propagate something which is not effective and you propagate, you earn millions out of it. And in the end you say, oh, sorry, uh, evidence is not right. But the thing is already gone now. So a false evidence propagated multiple times through multiple sources starts appearing real to us. It's true for everybody. I, uh, I actually have the opportunity to uh, convert a lot of infected total knee replacements into a knee arthrodesis. And if I get the opportunity to see their original x-rays, I see that many of them are young. Yes. They could have very well been treated with a high tibial osteotomy. Yes. Yeah. 
instead of subject I, I would like uh, to some of your photographs uh, on that to convey that it should not be done early enough yes that's true uh, if you can uh, because yeah. that is very important yeah. because yeah. now people start doing it 40 45 50 yeah. which is actually in that. I, I i came across a very interesting article several years ago that the mortality is higher if you perform a total knee arthroplasty below the age of 55. Uh -huh. Somehow, you know, this, I, I will dig this up, dig this article up for you. Right. I came across this article in the year about 2008, and I remember it very clearly right. that um, all cause mortality is higher if a total knee replacement is done below the age of 55. Yes. And uh, the, other, uh, the other thing to remember is that. You know, there's a German insurance, nationwide insurance collated database that up to 33% of the people who get a total knee arthroplasty are unhappy with the results. Yes. So it's not a panacea. Yeah. For multiple reasons. So, uh, you know, Dr. Dinesh is the one who's at the spearheading this, you know, why HTO is better than TKR. So, you know, all of us will do well to remember these, these right. statistics. Thank you. So, uh, I think uh, we should close this as we are already a little late. But I would like to uh, let the audience know that uh, as we had decided early. Can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Yes, we can. Yeah. We had done uh, these three, two webinars and one face-to-face -face program. And for audience to know that we'd be doing a, a webinar on techniques of medial and close vector osteotomy in July. In August, we have one topic, one speaker, Dr. Milin, will tell us about TCVO. Then we have a face-to-face -face program in October uh, at Gujarat. Dr. Thakkar is doing it. Then we have a webinar on technique of TCBO and, and DFO. And then finally, we have a pre-conference workshop on 13th at Lucknow. So uh, this is for everybody to think. And we are always ready to organize programs on demand on by lectures yes uh, professor rastogi i i um, i would like to tell you that hto 360 version 2 is going to be conducted on the 1st 2nd and 3rd of december this year again at akola we are going right. to have the physical presence of professor sukasa teramoto and nobuyuki takenaka who are the leading lights of the intra articular high tibial osteotomy from japan they are going to physically come and the program will be here soon. And I will apply to the IOA subcommittee to get recognition for this program from the IO. I will be in touch with you. And the first- uh, Pleasure will be ours. The first HTO 360 had four demo surgeries in two days. Only we, only we don't discuss UKR, we don't discuss TKR because enough has been done for them. And uh, it will be an exciting, and I, I really congratulate you for taking this up project for the IOA. You're doing a great job, sir. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Sir. And uh, then we have Dr. Thakka doing it in October for us. So we uh, thank Dr. Mittal and all the panelists and all the speakers and Ortho TV, IOA TV for their support and support of the association for giving us this platform. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Dinesh. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank, Thank you. you.